There we go. Hey, guys. Howdy. All right. Let's see if we can make this thing work. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, December 5th, 2014. Almost out of 2014. Very special day, though, today, which we will talk about in a second. So this week, we've got the Orion launch, the Hayabusa launch, and uh, pretty interesting stuff about inflation, filet, all kinds of good updates. So joining me this week, we've got Morgan Redbird. Hey, Morgan. Fraser. How is it all going? It's going well, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a good day. Yeah, it's been a very good day. <laughs> and we've got uh, Ramin Skiba. Hey, Ramin, how's it going? Hey, pretty good. It's busy in, at the end of the year, but going well. Yeah. Um, so thanks to apologize for last week. We uh, of course had our week off as uh, all of the Americans enjoyed uh, U.S. Thanksgiving, and I got a chance to enjoy U.S. Thanksgiving for the first time. Uh, I got to spend uh, spend the the Thanksgiving holidays in the states and uh, That's marshmallows good. on on sweet potatoes. Marshmallows. I've tried that once. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> That's pretty weird. That's pretty yeah. weird. So, uh, but uh, no, it was a lot of fun. So I want to remind everybody that you can access the um, the the Q and A app, which is running right now. You can just click on. Uh, it says Fraser Kane is interacting with the audience or something. I always forget what it says. Changes. Uh, anyway, click there and you can uh, see that. I can say hi to Nancy Graziano and S Stephen Hawkins, uh, Hugo Burnham, Sev Dust Bunny, Gazelle Sabarin. Uh, M23W23G, uh, Tony Lynch, wow, lots of people, Led Avron, Patrick Calhoun, Will Adoni, uh, Lars Peter Hammer, Chris Smith Marshall, yeah, this is awesome, hey everybody, uh, so there you go, that's the people in the Q&A app, feel free to throw your questions, I will try to remember to look at them, and, uh, and we will uh, pass these along, uh, now if you're wondering if I look a little different today, I have set up my desktop at my kitchen table. So I am I am sick and tired of using a laptop to do broadcasts on Google Plus Hangouts on Air. Uh, it is just it's the worst. So I got mountains of memory, fast computer, everything's really quick and zippy. It's the best. I highly recommend it, guys. So uh, okay, well, let's get cracking the first story. Of course, the big story this week is the Orion launch, and of course the the goal was for Orion to launch yesterday at some stupid time in the morning, 4 a.m., I think. Um, I was, uh, I don't know how about you guys were, but I was super lucky. They uh, they pushed the launch back a couple of hours. I was able to sort of, you know, get some coffee and catch the uh, a few delays, and then, of course, they uh, they had to cancel it. So, uh, But then it finally launched this week. So, so Morgan, did you watch? I did not watch. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it was 7 a.m. Uh, on the east coast of North America, which would have made it 5 a.m. for me, 4 a.m. for you guys. Too yeah. early to get up and watch uh, NASA yeah, TV. Better than that. Um, <laughs> call, call me when there's some humans in that thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but even though there weren't humans uh, in the launch this morning, um, this was a big... Uh, or is, it's ongoing actually as we speak. Uh, this is a big event for uh, NASA and for the future of manned spaceflight because what we're doing here with this first Orion launch is testing the first new NASA human spaceflight vehicle since the space shuttle. So this is the first attempt really since the 1980s uh, that NASA has had in creating and launching a new kind of manned spaceflight vehicle. Um, and of course, we're going to test it with nobody in it to begin with, but the goal is to, as quickly as possible, move up to getting people in this and getting them off uh, in the solar system. So what's happening on this uh, first launch is they strapped the Orion capsule on top of a Delta IV heavy rocket. And this is the largest rocket uh, currently flying uh, in the world today. Uh, and they're going to use, they use that to launch the uh, Orion capsule into Earth orbit. Uh, and this capsule uh, went much higher up than we typically send these sorts of things. Uh, so the space station orbits at a few hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface. Uh, this went up to 5,800 kilometers before slowly coming back down. Uh, and that's farther than any human uh, certified spacecraft has gone since uh, Apollo 17 left to go to the moon uh, in 1972. 
that's that's just mind bending. Yeah, and, and so the reason they go out that far is they want to bring it back as fast as possible, so that it hits the atmosphere as hard as possible, and they can really do a good stress test of the heat shield, the parachutes, and all of the other landing processes. Because when you come back from the moon, or if we were to come back from an asteroid or from Mars, you're going to be coming in much, much faster than, say, the space shuttle landing from the space station does. And so you need a much um, more robust heat protection system, and that's what they want to test uh, with this first first mission. And NASA has released some, some uh, really cool images, too, of, of both the Earth and, and the uh, and Orion itself. Now, and, and I mean, this mission was very quick, and so it, you know, it went up, it did its its high apogee, it went around, did it go around the Earth once, or it just came straight back down? I, I, think, think, it, I think it's still coming down. No, no, it, it's landed. The, oh, has it landed? landed? Okay, yeah, it's absolutely landed. landed. It's landed in the ocean, and they're, they're picking it up on a, uh, I'll try and find some pictures of it. Um, yes, I guess, I guess they're going to pick it up uh, in San Diego, so if I can get some, some pictures in person, I will, <laughs> I will definitely distribute those. Yeah, so this launch, you know, it's late 2014. Uh, you might think, you know, given the normal cadence for these kinds of things that we've seen, say, Orbital or SpaceX have, that we'd be looking at another launch or two next year. But the next Orion capsule launch won't now be till 2018, so four years from now. And that's because now that they've proven that the capsule basically works, they need to prove that the complete system works. And that includes strapping it on the Space Launch System, or SLS, which is NASA's next generation heavy launch rocket. And how heavy are we talking? Well, the baseline, the, the smallest of the SLSs, will be at about two and a half times more powerful than the um, Delta IV Heavy. Uh, and as I mentioned, that was you know the most powerful thing happening right now. And then the top end of the planned SLS will be uh, about one and a half times yet more powerful than that. And so these are big, powerful rockets that will be able to carry people and equipment to uh, places outside of Earth orbit. But the rocket's not ready yet. And they don't feel that they need to test the capsule over and over again without including all of the parts. And that includes the rocket. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting just how many heavy vehicles there are now coming around down the pike. There's, there's, the, you know, there's the Delta Heavy. There's... You know, plans of the works for maybe a, a heavier Ariane rocket. There's the Falcon Heavy, the SLS. So we're sort of entering this new age where, just a couple of years ago, there was there were very few ways to launch really heavy payloads. Once the space shuttle stopped launching, there's not a lot of ways to get heavy payloads into orbit. Now. Um, there's all of these competing launch systems all sort of coming online all at the same time. And all these different human-rated methodologies of getting people into space, right? You've already got the Soyuz rocket. Now you've potentially, you know, you've got what, you've got the Dragon capsule. Uh, you've got the, I guess, what the Chinese are doing. So, uh, you know, there's all of these this sort of, it's all coming back. It, I don't know. I know people, we had a sad time for the last decade or so. It all felt like everything was shutting down and, and we weren't exploring. And now suddenly, all this stuff's all happening happen. all at the same time. And it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and it's especially with these coming heavy uh, launch rockets, it's not just human spaceflight that has the opportunity to benefit here. The biggest uh, limiting factor on what we can do when we go to Jupiter or Saturn or if we wanted to go to Uranus or Neptune is the amount of weight we can carry, the amount of fuel we can bring along. And that's very limited right now by the fact that all interplanetary missions are pretty much launched on Atlas V rockets. Uh, which are smaller yet even than the Delta IV Heavy, and much smaller than the SLS and future heavy launch vehicles. And so if we can get those price competitive, and SLS will probably never be price competitive, but if some of these sort of more intermediate sized ones can be more price competitive, we can launch bigger, more comprehensive missions uh, than we've been able to do today. Um, cool, cool. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, so, <laughs> Elad Avron says, Hi, everyone. I want to hear the panel's detailed and explicit opinion on the new Star Wars teaser trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys watched it yet? I have watched it. Uh, I'm optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm optimistic. Specifically, right. the cross-guard lightsaber. 
That's uh, what everybody is talking about. Yeah, yeah I, I liked <laughs> Stephen Colbert's explanation of it, and if you haven't watched that, you should go over to his website and see his breakdown of how the cross guard might actually work because it's kind of freaky how much detail he put into that. <laughs> yeah, I think people forget that Stephen Colbert is a total space... He's a, a true nerd at heart. Yeah, he, uh, you know, he makes Dungeons and Dragons references all the time, so he knows his, uh, he knows his stuff. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. But you know... Uh, I don't. I don't even want to spoil it. I know. I'll bet you there's a segment of our audience that won't even watch the tr the teaser trailer because they don't want it to be spoiled in any way, shape, or form. And I am a terrible spoiler person. In fact, uh, I can't even believe I'm going to admit this, but my friends, uh, their pet saying, if you spoil something, is is to Fraser it. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, not that's a good position to be. I don't in. want to phrase that for you. And uh, a friend of mine who's read the books already spoiled something yesterday about it. I I will oh, not no. say it. There are books. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh. Yeah. I'm. I'm pretty excited. I can't wait. Um. Uh. For those of you who didn't know, a new Star Wars teaser trailer exists. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Um. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to the next story. So, so uh, Morgan, why don't we talk about the other big launch of the week, which is the Hayabusa 2. Yeah, so this was back on Tuesday, uh, and it too was delayed a couple of days. It was supposed to <clears throat> originally launch on uh, November 30th, ended up getting delayed back to uh, December 3rd, uh, but they finally got it launched, uh, and Hayabusa 2 is a mission that's going to an asteroid to sample it and bring it back. Uh, and this is actually not the first time that we've done this. And in fact, it's not the first time that Japanese have done this. This is a Japanese mission. Uh, and it's going to the asteroid 1999 JU-3. We always give things such awesome names here in astronomy. And it's going to go and it's going to study this asteroid. It's going to pick up multiple pieces of it. And it's going to fly them back and drop them off in Earth's atmosphere. And I was reading over the sort of mission description and the description of the spacecraft uh, in preparation for this, and I realized that if, uh, if Batman had a spacecraft, uh, it would be Hayabusa 2, because they basically crammed everything in the kitchen sink that you could think would be really cool in a spacecraft uh, into Hayabusa 2. It has a small little impactor that they can drop to make their own crater on the surface so they can go in and sample fresh material. It has not one, not two, not three, but four separate landers, three different rovers, and a lander that can hop around on the surface uh, to study various parts of this, um, this asteroid. And it has a suite of scientific instruments on board the main mothership as well. And so they really are going to cover this uh, asteroid in in a way that we've never uh, had the opportunity to do before. It's going to bomb it. It's going to land on it. It's going to rove across it. It's going to collect samples and return them to Earth. This is this is a really awesome uh, mission. And I, you know, I mean, if if what happened with Rosetta is any indication of what the excitement is going to be like, this is going to be of that same classification. I mean, I think, um, you know, we have been talking about Rosetta for the last you know, forever, about how exciting this was going to be. And I think a big part of it is all this anticipation about how it just it came, it got close, it orbited, it tried to lower the the, the lander down and all the problems with that. And, and it's we're gonna get, Yeah, we're going to get that same kind of excitement and all that adventure with, with Hayabusa 2. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that'll come uh, in 2018 uh, is when Hayabusa 2 will arrive at um, the comet. And then it'll spend some time uh, studying the comet. It'll touch down. The main mothership will touch down three times on the comet to pick up, or the asteroid. We've been talking about Rosetta too much. Uh, <laughs> on the asteroid to pick up three different kinds of material from the surface and um, bring them back uh, to Earth. And they'll drop them off in t December of 2020 if everything goes uh, as planned. Um, and one of the things you might be wondering is, you know, a, haven't we already done this? Uh, Hayabusa 1 visited a comet about, a, or an asteroid about 10 years ago. Uh, and also, um, you know, isn't OSIRIS-REx, the NASA mission, doing uh, the same thing? And the answer is yes, but we have a lot to learn here. Because we often sort of have this conception of asteroids as all being the same. And that uh, couldn't be farther from the truth. There are lots of very different kinds of asteroids. 
Uh, for example, the first Hayabusa visited an asteroid that's um, what we call S-type. And S-type means it's full of silicates, and silicates are a fancy word for rock. So basically, it's a, a rocky asteroid. This one that Hayabusa 2 is going to is what we call a C-type, and that stands for having a lot of carbon. And so we think that C-type asteroids are some of the oldest in the solar system and are likely to be places where we find a lot of carbon-type organic material uh, on the surface. And, um, and OSIRIS-REx will be going to what we call a B-type asteroid. And that's a certain kind of carbonaceous asteroid that is of particular interest to us. And so we expect that these asteroids will be completely different from each other. And so it's almost like visiting a whole new class of object every time you go to a different asteroid. And so it makes sense for us to go not once, not twice, but three or four times to sort of get a sense of the range of asteroids that are out there in the solar system. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, what do you mean, haven't we already done this? Haven't we? Have uh, no, we haven't done this. We haven't done this kind of, and, and we could do a million of them. So let's let's keep rolling. Um, who are those people? Give me their names. The people who've been saying that to you. <laughs> I, I want to talk to them. All right, let's move on. Uh, so so Ramin, uh, you've been following the updates that have happened with the Planck conference. Yeah, so there's a conference that they called uh, Planck 2014, which was in uh, Ferrara, Italy, this week. Um, I was just looking at the program, and it looks uh, like an excellent list of speakers. Wish I were there myself. Um, and, and in fact, there's some people who were talking about um, how Planck, how results from other telescopes are relevant to Planck results. So, for example, um, Herschel and uh, Planck were launched at the same time, and uh, David Elbaz gave a talk about um, extragalactic emission from both telescopes. Um, I'm a member of the BOSS survey, the uh, uh, Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey, and uh, a colleague of mine, Shirley Ho, gave a talk there. Um, but in any case, what, what, from what I've heard, there are a lot of updates from Planck, and uh, we're really sort of getting um, hints at the results that they're about to release. But there will be the official re release of their results will be in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Journal on December 22nd. So if you want some uh, Christmas uh, reading, you can uh, um, uh, uh, watch for that. So what the Planck Telescope is, is looking at is, is they're making maps of the um, microwave background radiation, uh, which dates back from the uh, the very early universe. And uh, this this radiation um, has shows temperature fluctuations, which we th think are related to density fluctuations. These are really really tiny fluctuations on the order of one in a hundred thousand. And so some parts of the of the universe are slightly below uh, the mean, and some are slightly above. And we think that um, these sort of fluctuations tell us about how structure forms, how dark matter clumps up, and then eventually how galaxies form or group structures of galaxies. And uh, and so these results are really exciting. They also tell us about the uh, uh, the the abundance of baryonic matter, as in the matter that we're used to, um, and and dark matter. Um, and so we think that uh, so based on Planck results, we think that close to five percent of the uh, uh, of, of of the uh, energy density of the universe is due to dark matter, around 25% due to regular matter, and then the rest is uh, uh, dark energy. And so th there are, uh, so some of the, some of these new results do tell us something about, for example, what particles are are likely or unlikely candidates for dark matter. So it does seem like um, neutrinos are an unlikely candidate. Uh, uh, neutrinos, uh, if neutrinos were the dominant uh, dark matter species, they, then you'd have, uh, for example, much less structure and less um, large structures, like like we see with with galaxy clusters, than um, than we actually observe in the universe, and that you actually see with Planck. And so it seems like uh, at least the the main neutrino candidates are unlikely to be the dominant species. So I, at least from what I've seen so far, uh, I think this is they're really just sort of. Uh, I don't know if these are. What they've said so far, we already had ideas about what uh, about this already. So, so I'm not sure how new that is, but maybe they're waiting to have a big impact with the on December 22nd. Um, right. Another thing that I heard was that there's a uh, um, a joint uh, uh, paper coming up from Bicep Two and Planck, and so that I think will be very important because we've talked about the Bicep Two controversy before about how much uh, about whether their detection of of inflation from um, Gravita uh, from primordial gravitational waves, whether that's 
well, I mean, whether it's due to those waves or whether they're due to dust in, in our own galaxy. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad that instead of arguing with each other, they've agreed to pool their, their data and results together and, and write a joint paper together. And so apparently within, I don't know, the next month or two, we should expect to see those results. And so um, I, I hadn't heard about this in, until this uh, I saw the news about this conference, and so I think, uh, I think this will be exciting. If, if, they're, if they're willing to say that it's coming up, then it must be, uh, they must be making progress with that. Well, the, I mean, the, the mention that I had seen from a couple, you know, our, our Brian Koberlein had written a whole series on on this, and the, I mean, the gist is really just further refinement that that the Planck data absolutely has just just better refined the temperature, the age of the universe, the the amounts of dark matter versus versus matter, and just really continues down this this sort of understanding and and as they refine this data and get much more precise numbers then various models of dark matter and and such start to fall away and have less and less support just because the the actual measurements of these things preclude various you know models of dark matter and and such so so Absolutely. nothing really I mean, surprising came out of this and yet it was just a much finer, granular uh, measurement of the cosmic microwave background radiation. That, that's a good point. I mean, we're definitely in an era of precision cosmology uh, now, now with Planck. I, I mean, f say five years ago, we thought that the matter uh, density of the universe was maybe somewhere between one-fourth and one-third, and at best, maybe, maybe even the range was w wider than that. And now they're saying, you know, 0.31 something, plus or minus something else. And so it's, it's definitely more precise, and that's, that's something that, um, and as you're saying, it, it, does, it rules out some models and is consistent with others. And so it's definitely a, a step forward. Fantastic. Uh, okay, let's, let's move on to the, uh, let me see if I've got some questions. I am, I'm never good about getting questions. So um, uh, here's a good one. This comes from Benjamin Stieber. Uh, what is the current state of nuclear rocket technology? Will we get uranium or thorium NTR in the next uh, decade? Have you been following the state of nuclear rockets, or is there any progress at all? I haven't really been following it, um, but if I had to wager, I would say that uh, the political issues surrounding anything with the word nuclear in it will hold back this technology uh, going forward. Uh, at this point, we're really just trying to get enough uh, radioactive material to make uh, the power sources that we need for deep space uh, missions. In fact, Europe can produce none of that by law. The uh, United States is producing it at a very small rate, like less than a kilogram per year. Um, and the, uh, Russia is really uh, not producing very much anymore either. And so this sort of political uh, turn against nuclear power in general is having a very dampening effect on, um, on yeah. its use in space. Yeah, it's, it's I mean... There was a great graphic. I think Nature did an article just just in the last week or so, and they had this great infographic about about how much of the plutonium is left available for these these RTGs, and how much NASA needs. And they really only have enough for a couple of of sizable missions like Cassini style missions or a few small ones like New Horizons, things like that. But they just they just don't have enough for all the kinds of missions that people are going to want to do. Um, and the other great use of, for example, like a nuclear plant is for some of these really high concept uh, ion engines, right? That You get a really powerful RTG that can generate a ton of electricity and then use that to power an ion drive like what Dawn has and what... Um, Hayabusa 2 has one. Hayabusa 2 has one, yeah, exactly. And, and that is an enormous amount of thrust over a long period of time and and something that will get you, you know, tremendous velocity changes. And you know, one mission, for example, that was that was suggested was that you could have a spacecraft that could orbit each of the, uh, the Jovian moons in sequence. It could come down, it could orbit Europa, and then it could orbit Callisto, and then it could orbit Ganymede, and then it could or orbit Io, and just, you know, it would have enough energy and thrust to be able to just come in and out of orbit on each one of these moons. And that's because you've got this amazing power of the RTG. Uh, but, I mean, you know, we're not answering the question. Uh, nuclear rockets, I haven't seen, you know, we haven't reported on any in a long time. I haven't seen, you know, anyone seriously making any tests for them, and I don't know. It's a it's a funny time. I think we're gonna have to see what happens with uh, SpaceX and and all those guys with their new class. Because if 
if SpaceX can do a reusable rocket and really severely decrease the price of rockets, then you know, then the it's a whole new era in space exploration. So, uh, I got one more question here. Uh, it comes from Tony Lynch. Um, will they use the Orion to bring astronauts to the International Space Station? Uh, they don't want to. So the mission specification right now has one flight to the space station uh, as a possibility if commercial crew transport doesn't succeed. Uh, but launching SLS will cost somewhere in the order of 300 to 400 million dollars. Uh, launching the Falcon 9 costs about 80 million dollars. Um, so they would like to rely on commercial troop transport, uh, whether that's through Boeing or through SpaceX, uh, but they have the capability to do that if they would need to do that uh, because for some reason or another uh, commercial crew transport doesn't work out. And that's like that's how much it costs to launch a space shuttle. I mean, it's it's an expensive right. vehicle. Yes. Um, okay, cool. All right, we'll keep rolling then. Um, okay, so let's move on. Uh, where's my list of oh, stories? Um, so, well, Morgan, you posted this, uh, which is that uh, nature has made all the articles free to view. Yeah, so I thought this might actually be more interesting to uh, some of the viewers than might you might first imagine. Uh, so here's the situation. Uh, right now, if a scientist wants to publish uh, a scientific paper, say I discover the cure to cancer. Uh, Nicely might, done. Yeah, I might want to publish that, say, in Nature, one of the world's leading science journals. In order to do that, I'm going to have to pay Nature uh, for every page that I want them to publish. And it usually costs somewhere on the order of $100 for every page that you want to publish. And you, you, know, you or your grant or your university has to write them a check before they'll ever basically look at your article. And, and if you then, have lots of figures and tables, that adds up really quickly. Yeah, and if you want color, that costs extra. It, it, you get nickel and dimed. Uh, on the other end, though, once it goes into publication, if you, you know, Jane Reader, want to read my article, you also have to pay. Uh, and if you want to, if you go to Nature right now and you try to, to buy an article, it usually costs like twenty-five to fifty dollars to buy one article to use. Uh, and most people get it, their access through universities, who pay tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for access to these journals. Uh, but it's the researchers basically paying on both ends. Uh, now, Nature and journals like them say that this is a necessary uh, expense because creating a high-quality journal like Nature or Science is expensive. And in fact, they say it costs between sort of thirty and fifty thousand dollars to publish one article in one of these top-flight journals. But with more and more focus on public funding, especially in uh, in fields like astronomy, a lot of funding agencies are now requiring that their work be published in journals that are available to the public. Uh, and that's not the case for things like uh, nature or science or, or what have you. And also just so that work can be read as widely as possible. So for example, say if I wrote a story about um, Hayabasa results uh, for Universe Today, I might want to include a source to the material that I'm citing. And so I, sitting on a university campus, reading this article, I paste the link in to Universe Today, uh, and I hit post. You then click the article, and the first thing you get asked for is money. You don't get to read anything about the article except for the abstract. So I could be, you know, be straight up lying to you about what is in that article, and you'd basically have no way to check. Yep. And so nature thinks that they found a middle ground. They don't want to just give PDFs away because then they have difficulty selling subscriptions to nature that they need for their income stream. But they understand that it's necessary that people be able to examine journal articles uh, in a timely fashion. And so what they have basically constructed is a way for you to look at journal articles on their website without being able to download them, copy them, or print them. And so if all you want to do is read them, and they even give you some tools to annotate them, uh, then you can do all of this now with Nature articles for free. But if you want to print that article out and highlight it, uh, then you have to pay them money. And they're likening this to the, uh, the iTunes model of the iPod era, which is kind of a special analogy considering Apple's currently being sued over that model. Um, but the idea being that as long as you stay within their ecosystem, you'll be able to move around uh, and work with your documents. But they're not going to let you just copy it and give it out to all of your friends. 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, I'm sure that's what they're saying. Uh, the reality is, is that there's tremendous pressure now from all of the various open uh, publishing models. There's all kinds of new models on the internet that are coming fast and furious and looking to just completely tear open the whole established uh, way that journals work. And, and some of these, you know, it's really, it's just a momentum thing that nature and science and all of these folks have been doing this for 100 plus years and have built up that they are the leading journals. But the reality is, is that there are a ton of communities. We're really fortunate in the astronomy area because we've got Astro PH, which is this, right. the pre-press uh, listing that almost all space, you know, astronomy, physics related uh, journals go through and and I I love to go through there and and find potential story ideas. You got to be a little and careful, that, but you know uh, there's great there's great ideas in there. I was just gonna say articles are there uh, are there for free, and so when people post them, you know you don't need to go through a uh, um, through a journal's website, and so you can usually get the final versions or close to final versions of, of papers uh, for free that way. And, and I heard someone joke that if, if it's not on Astro PH, then it didn't happen. <laughs> and so uh, but basically, uh, uh, some people ex exclusively or primarily use go through Astro PH. It's, it's on the archive, ARXIV, um, rather than going through the journals just because of the ease of it. So it's definitely changing things. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name. I, I heard. The, I listened to this great interview with. Um, Oh, I'm trying to remember who it was, but there's one that's just is the open access directory. Anyway, there's there's one that's that's gained has like 10 million researchers already using it. It's like the Facebook of open research. There's so this is like ResearchGate. Is that the one? You're... Is it ResearchGate or is it Academia? Uh, I forget the name of it. I I apologize. Um, uh, but there's a there's a there's a ton of these and. Uh, it's going to come, you know, I think this is, this is the, the journals trying to sort of close the barn doors after the horses have already left, and, and I think they're getting tons of pressure from the U.S. government. I know Obama specifically said, this is ridiculous that we are, that we're paying for all this research, and all it's doing is it's enriching the pockets of the of the journals that that all this information isn't available, and yet this is this is U.S. taxpayer money that then U.S. taxpayers have to spend more money to be able to get access to the research once it's once it's published. So, um, and this is oh. I think this is them responding to these these pressures from the people like the NIH and so on who are actually funding the research in the first place. A, a related issue, uh, real quick, it's just that. Uh, Basically, when we do peer review, that's the, we do that for free. So yeah, you don't get don't paid pay. for peer review. Yeah. <laughs> right? So where's the $50,000 going? <laughs> yeah. Is it your not pocket? To <laughs> yeah, not to scientists. It's going to the conspiracy theorists. Anyway. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm excited. Open is better. Transparent is better. Internet is king. I can't wait. So good job, Nature, uh, releasing this to the public. Elsevier, you're next, um, and uh, and yeah, science, and science, and all of you guys. We look forward to uh, to this open future. Thank you for embracing it. All right, uh, let's take a couple more questions. This is fun. Um, uh, Elad Avran asks: uh, So, do the journals also put the articles through some process of review? Does it make it pay per page? Put the authenticity of the articles in question because it's a source of income for the journal, so they basically publish as long as you pay. Top journals don't do that. Uh, the, the, this, you know, the idea of peer review and open access and these journals is—it's a contentious issue in the community because everybody doesn't like the system how it is now. Uh, as Ramin mentioned, we you know we pay on both ends. We don't get paid for doing the majority of the work, uh, but everybody agrees that you need a peer review process. Uh, and the good journals, things like Nature and Science and Icarus and places like that, they they give you know credibility and people believe the results that you see in those kinds of journals and that's an important thing to have in science because uh, not every scientist can be an expert even on all the aspects of their field and you're trusting basically you're trusting these guys to find somebody who is the expert and can make some sort of substantial comment about it. Yeah, the peer review process is not a panacea but it definitely 
Um, I definitely believe results more when I when I you know after they've gone through the peer review process. And so it's uh, in fact sometimes I'm really pressed for time and I really don't read many papers that haven't gone gone through a peer reviewer. And so it's so basically the best situation is when you have one reviewer, maybe occasionally you have more than one, and, and an engaged editor, and it usually will iterate a couple of times. And so it's it definitely uh, improves the process. And, and I want to say it's not like journals are all or you know, try to push for a longer paper or try to, you know, shoo three things through. I mean, they definitely want it to be a thorough process. And in fact, you're supposed to, as a reviewer, make sure that there aren't, there aren't redundancies or things that are in a paper that don't need to be. And so it's not like they try to go for the longest paper and, and shove it through. That, that's, that doesn't happen. Um, okay, well, let's keep, uh, let's keep rolling. We're starting to get a little low on time. Um... Um, let's see. All right, well, I'm going to move on to some of the... So we've got a bunch of stories um, that come from the Weekly Space Hangout crew. And for those of you who aren't aware, that this is a community on Google+, uh, populated by the diehard fans of the Weekly Space Hangout. I, 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 I can't believe we have diehard fans of the Weekly Space Hangout, but uh, we absolutely do, um, and uh, we love them all. Uh, so anyway, you can go to Google+, Plus, do a search for the WSH crew, and, uh, and you can sort of see the community there. Just a few hundred people, but they are really dedicated. It's a great community. And the, over the course of the week, they post all kinds of stories that are interesting them, and we steal them for a segment uh, here on the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, no, it's more of a... It's a symbiotic relationship, really. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so let's go on. So one is sort of a big update, which is uh, what happened with Philae, and and we're getting more details about what happens. This comes from Vladimir Pesha, uh, who posted on the 28th of November, and this is this idea that that f there was more to Philae's motions and sort of how it ended up. So, uh, uh, Morgan, were you following that? Yeah. So now, sort of in the aftermath of the the Philae saga, they're going back through the data more carefully, and they're using various different instruments to better reconstruct an idea of the trajectory and velocity and timing of the various bounces and moves that Philae did uh, during its descent. And one of the things that they noticed was that they had registered an extra contact. Uh, above and beyond what uh, they'd previously thought. And it was sort of a fleeting contact. It didn't seem like the angle and velocity, they weren't right for it to have basically plunked down on the ground again. Um, and so what they think happened, given the trajectory that they've reconstructed and a map of the surface, is that during its first bounce, uh, it skimmed right off the edge of uh, a crater. So one of the rim, uh, rims of craters were kind of built up above the surface, and it nicked one of those on its way. Um, and, and this is pretty remarkable. Not only that they were able to figure this out, but that the uh, lander was able to remain upright even after sort of you know tripping basically over the rim of this crater. And it just kind of shows how lucky we were uh, in these events to end up with our lander uh, upright in a position that it could do the science that it did. Uh, and now that we sort of see the complicated path that it took to get there, uh, it's even more remarkable. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just, it's astonishing that it even worked at all. <laughs> you know, we were talking about before, right, that the, that the weight of the lander was one gram on That's the right. surface of the comet and that it bounced a kilometer. It, it tried as hard as it could to land as softly and as gently as it could, and it still bounced one whole kilometer, and then perhaps, you know, bounced another time and maybe a third time. And I saw a picture of someone had recreated what the position that Philae was probably in, and it's pretty much just on its side, up against, you know, in the shade, up against rocks, you know, not a not a good landing in the end. At least it didn't completely bounce off. Could have, to Could have happened. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what happened to uh, the lander that Hayabusa one tried to drop ten years ago. Is there was a miscommunication and the the instead of ended, hitting the surface and, and sticking, it ended up lost into deep space. Uh, and so it could happen. And fortunately, Philae dodged that fate. 
I think you know next time they really need to go with the you know the the real the concept of the harpoon as we're imagining it, not the concept of the harpoon as these little right. you know these little stakes on the bottom of the lander, but really you know shoot a harpoon from about a kilometer away and just you know really drive it in like a Batman uh, harpoon, a Gatling hook, and then just you know reel like the white whale in yeah like yeah exactly. Um, so that's I think you know that's uh, that's I think the future and more and more gyros obviously but uh, um, all right let's uh, let's move on uh, okay so we got another story here um, this is interesting so this one comes from uh, let's see which one do you want to do do you want to do the uh, atomic hydrogen emission in galaxies at record breaking distances. Sure, we can start with that one. Sure. So this one comes from Helga Bjorkog uh, on December 3rd. So, and yes. please translate what the, the gibberish I just said. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when people try to... So when you think of uh, how a galaxy forms, the, the stars don't just come out of nothing. The, the stars in, in a galaxy um, form from gas. And so you have to have gas first. And uh, so then the question is, how do we probe this gas? Because what we see when we look at most, most kinds of telescopes, we see the stars. And we don't see the gas. So we don't see, you know, the, the, the fuel for, for future star formation or, or galaxy growth. And so um, there are different ways to probe it. And one, one way is to look at what's called atomic hydrogen. So there's, there's hydrogen both in, um, uh, it, you can have both atomic or molecular hydrogen, but it's the, the atomic kind, uh, what they call H1, which is more easily detectable by telescopes. And so what these uh, astronomers uh, at Swinburne in Australia did is they used the uh, Arecibo telescope, the radio telescope, to, to detect uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, hydrogen gas. There, there's other kinds of gas uh, as well, but hydrogen is, is the easiest to detect. And so it, it tells you about what the bulk of the gas is doing. And uh, what, we, what, what, is, what is not well known is exactly what the gas fraction is um, of galaxies of different sizes and, and especially at different redshifts. It's just really hard to see galaxies that are far away, as in galaxies that are formed longer ago, um, to see to see how, how they might have formed. And uh, so the, the the important result here is that they're they're detecting uh, how much gas are in um, various uh, you know disk galaxies and spiral galaxies um, at uh, uh, beyond our quote unquote local neighborhood. And so it's so it's it's sort of a, a step forward as far as looking at how galaxies form, because it's something that's that, that's definitely an open uh, right. an open question right now. This idea that as you look further out, you're looking backwards in time, and you're getting a sense of what the state of the universe in earlier eras. Um, let's let's move on. Um, right. Okay. So, and did you look at this one um, uh, about the uh, the Grand Asteroid Challenge, Morgan? Yeah. So yeah. It comes from Jim Meeker, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so over the next decade, we're going to be hearing a lot about asteroids from NASA, both because OSIRIS-REx is launching in 2016 to go to an asteroid and bring a piece back. Uh, Hayabusa 2 will be at an asteroid in 2018, but also because the first sort of planned human use for Orion is to go out, grab an asteroid, sling it in orbit around the moon, and study it. Uh, And the idea being we'll be able to learn just as much more about asteroids by humans uh, hitting it with hammers as we will uh, Apollo astronauts on the moon. Uh, And to kind of get the public engaged in the idea of understanding more about asteroids, not just as giant threatening uh, death machines, but as interesting scientific topics, NASA has created a series of challengers for for the community to engage in to better understand. And these are basically 10 programs that you can do to sort of learn more about asteroids. And they range from playing online games that teach you about asteroids to 3D models that you can print that then create a robotic telescope to uh, a simple open source software for designing mirrors for telescopes. So if you want to build a mirror to put in your new robotic telescope. And they really just want to get people more engaged with the idea that you don't have to be at a huge observatory to study asteroids or to understand asteroids, and that, in fact, uh, average people can make very uh, exceptional contributions to asteroid science. 
Very cool. Um, and of course, as a you know, since I actually work at uh, Hero X, which is an offshoot of the uh, of the X Prize, um, you know, these kinds of challenges are really interesting to us. This idea that that you can really engage the public in being able to get involved, and NASA is one of the the best at this. They've done a ton of these kinds of challenges and gotten people involved. So this is great. Um, Cool. Okay, let's move on to uh, to one. Of course, our our good friend uh, Sandy Springman uh, works on is going to be working on the Osiris Rex mission as well. Right. So we should be able to get the inside scoop on that mission. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, so let's we'll do one more. Uh, which one do you want? Do you want to do the uh, the cosmological theory goes inflation free? Do you want to do this one? This one comes from Nancy Graziano. Sure, we can do that. Um, so. I, I used to be at, at the, I used to work at the University of Arizona, and I uh, have briefly met the the author of this paper, uh, Fulvio Melia, and so he argues that uh, so so in what we think when, as far as the the growth of the universe very early on is that uh, there's this rapid period of growth that we call inflation, and it seems to answer some questions about uh, about the, the the size and expansion of the universe and its acceleration. Uh, the, the 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 currently standard view of of uh, of the growth of the universe and, and and as far as galaxy formation and structure formation goes is is called uh, lambda CDM where CDM refers to cold dark matter um, so not neutrinos and uh, and not other kinds of particles um, and then the lambda refers to the cosmological constant um, which uh, is is dark energy and and then so what his his theory is that maybe inflation um, might not be the uh, uh, might not be correct, and that there might be some other explanation. And so he has this um, theory which he refers to um, uh, an R R equals C T universe, where um, R refers to the Hubble radius, C is the speed of light, and uh, 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 and T is the age of the universe. And so he's 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 trying to so I don't actually know the details of, of his model but it's it's sort of another I think a more exotic but potentially interesting uh, 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 explanation about how uh, the the universe reached the size that it did so so basically if if it's not in inflation then something you need some sort of an alternative um, explanation but he but I think it it right now I think it's not uh, it's not clear that his his uh, uh, his theory uh, is correct. I think he, it is based on uh, WMAP and Planck data, but he acknowledges that um, the signal that he's trying to reproduce with the model um, could be due to things like foreground noise, statistical biases, or instrumental errors, the same kind of things that BICEP2 is, is dealing with. And so I think it's, um, it's too early to say, basically, whether or not inflation is right or whether um, uh, Melia's model uh, is correct. But it's, de it's definitely interesting. I think it's definitely worth proposing um, alternatives like this. So I, th I think we'll just have to wait and see. M maybe with the new Planck papers we'll, uh, we'll have more information about, um, about you know, how, how consistent this theory is or not. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to do one piece of shameless, uh, not self-promotion exactly. Hold on one second here. Uh, so the Year in Space 2015 calendar is out. Um... And we're doing a giveaway on Universe Today, so uh, they're awesome. And you may not believe me, but this is not an advertisement. So, <laughs> so, so they are not a sponsor of Universe Today. We just love their calendar so much. And we've been uh, sort of just involved with him every year, and uh, and he always uh, sends me a bunch and sends Nancy a bunch, and uh, and uh, we usually I try to have one up behind me as I do a show. So they're just great, and um, uh, and so you can go to the Year in Space uh, website. Uh, yearinspace.com, but we're doing a giveaway on Universe Today. So if you go to Universe Today and uh, do a search for the Year in Space, it's probably in the last four, last three four days. Is right that now. calendar a uh, Fraser Kane signed uh, Year in no. Space calendar? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't work on it, but um, uh, but anyway, so we're giving we're giving a couple of them away, and so you can just all you have to do you just put your email address into the giveaway, and then we just pick a, a couple of names randomly, and and they'll send them directly to you. So uh, get your own Year in Space calendar. 
There we go. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is uh, um, we just have, well, we've still been releasing a ton of videos uh, on our YouTube channel, and some of them are really great. The, what came before the Big Bang, and uh, and some of these were panned, written by, uh, by Brian Koberlein. So it's, it was a nice collaboration with us and, and Brian Koberlein. And there's a really great run now. The next eight episodes over the next month are, I, I just reviewed them all, and they're just they're so much fun. I'm really, really proud of them. So if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, which is where you're watching this right now. So anyway, uh, anyway, let's, and now that's enough shameless self-promotion from me. Uh, Morgan, uh, shamelessly self-promote. Yeah, well, you can find me uh, on uh, Twitter at, at Morgan Renberg. Um, asking why uh, Orion launches at 5 in the morning. Uh, if you want to know uh, why and how uh, spacecraft take the pictures that they do, you can read my story over uh, on Universe Today, uh, and you can always see my blog at cosmicchatter.org. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, you've, you've given us a bunch. One was all about uh, imagery and how, uh, how we're being lied to by uh, scientists. It's a gentle lie. It's a gentle lie when we look at these beautiful pictures of space. And actually, that's one of the topics that I did as well. And uh, we were pretty uh, pretty sarcastic about this one. So uh, I think you'll, you'll like it. Um, all right, uh, Ramin, where do we find out more? So um, you can find me on Twitter at Ramin Skiba. Um, you can also uh, look up my blog, RaminSkiba.net, where I write about um, uh, various astronomy news stories and science policy issues and events. Um, there's also links to articles and, and blogs that I've written elsewhere. Um, and if you're interested in my research on uh, galaxy formation, dark matter, and cosmology, uh, you can find my website at UC San Diego um, with links to my research and publications, including free copies of my papers. So, now, uh, free copies of your papers. That's <laughs> great. Now, you didn't put your, your Twitter handle in, but it is your name right now. Oh, I did. Yes. Mashed I together. Forgot. So, yes. uh, everyone, Absolutely. if you're just watching this right now and you want to follow Ramin on Twitter, just type it in right. We'll just wait. Just, just wait, and you just type it in on your Twitter and subscribe to him, follow him on Twitter. Right? Have you got it? Everyone got that right now? Okay, perfect. Okay, cool. So, uh, now, uh, Morgan, were you going to jump in and answer some questions? Uh, I can't jump in and answer questions oh, today, no. so save them for next week, okay. uh, and we'll do a double, double session next week. That sounds great. Cool. All right. Well, then let's get uh, let's wrap this up. So, hey, thanks, guys, for joining me this week. Thanks to everyone who watched. Uh, if you haven't already, go hit the Weekly Space Hangout crew community on Google Plus and continue the conversation and the fun. And um, we will see you all next week. <laughs>